This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. It's 1107 at WPSL 1590, the talk of the Treasure Coast. You're on Ask a Rabbi. And this is Rabbi Shafir Loeb of Congregation Eitzchayim, your Jewish home on the Treasure Coast. And uh, yeah, here I am catching up with technology as always. So here we go. All right, folks. So this is the eve. uh, Tonight will be the beginning of Nisan, which is the month that Passover happens in. So it's the beginning of April, and it'll be the beginning of Nissan. The calendars are a little bit aligned uh, this year. They're not often, but they are this time. Did you say Nissan? Nissan. That's, yeah. It's, it sounds, sounds like Japanese. The, yeah, I, I know. I know. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Huh. But it's not. It's the old name for the holiday. And, um, yeah. Not the holiday of the month. I'm sorry. Hang on a second. I need to share this to me. So uh, you need a few more devices. In I, front do, of you, you I, know? Do. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Oh my! Uh, I've got way too many. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So here boy. we go. But now I can see this. So there, there we go. go. Cool. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So Passover is the full moon in the month of Nisan. Nisan is the first month. And otherwise also, um, yeah, otherwise known as the month of Aviv, the month of spring. That's the old Hebrew name. Nisan is the Mesopotamian name for the holiday, for the month. Really? Yeah. Okay. When, when, huh. the, when we were in exile in Babylonia, otherwise known as Baghdad, um, the, when the Jews came back, when the group that the 10 to 15 percent that came back wasn't a very large number but they brought with them a whole lot of things like the local names for months and things like that because people tend to adopt the language and customs of where they live and blend it in and that was historic Uh, yeah you know they just brought part of history with them yeah well because they had acculturated in the area sure Even, even though they tended to live among themselves because people tended to it was easier to practice your religion and your other practice but you still interacted and you did trade and and all of that so you had to be aware of what was going on and it made sense to take the trade recognized names for the months back home with you and so yeah the the names of the months change the only one that keeps its Hebrew name is the month of Av in the summer and other than that, yeah, they're Mesopotamian or Syriac names. So, not Syrian, but Syriac. Slightly different. They're, it's one of the challenges in the Middle East is to recognize the period from which certain things come. Okay, so was Syriac an actual nation? No, it's, it's more a language and a culture. It's a language, yeah. okay. Okay, and what you're in having... In Syria? In the area that now we would call Syria, okay. the, the oh, Levant, oh. right? Th- okay. That part of it. And there's a whole lot of trade going on. The Silk Road is already in existence. Which you've talked about for right. years. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's been around for a while. And at that point, the Zoroastrians are in charge in Persia and in the Levant in that area. The Zoroastrians are a huge religion. And they won't start to fall until the Muslims come up and, con- and conquer a big chunk of the world. And, uh, and then, of course, when the Mongols convert to Islam, you see a whole lot of diminishing of, of other religions because they just were so big. So there's, there's a constant change in flux. It was interesting. I was, I, I'm trying to remember what class, what, either a class or a discussion that I was part of, and somebody said, uh, everybody, all, they were talking about Christianity and saying Christianity, all the Christian relig- uh, holidays, rather, are absorbed from others. And it's not just Christianity, folks. All religions evolve and take holidays. They trade and, and shift and, and jiggle and 
whatever. There's a variety of reasons behind each holiday. And we're coming up on the hol- the Jewish holiday of Pesach or Passover. Pesach means the, the lamb, the yearling lamb that is to be culled from the herd. Which, which happens every spring. Every spring, right. You're going to do that shortly before the young ladies go into, into heat, into rut. It's called rut. Because the boys will fight. And the birthing rate of sheep and goats is about the same as humans. It's about 50-50. So if God gives you a hundred little little girl sheep and they're now yearlings, so they're about to come into their first heat, you've got a hundred little boys running around who want to breed with all of those young ladies. And so you're going to have this incredible hostility because little boy sheep rams are just deaf. They're not bright to start with, but they're really not bright when the girls are in heat. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, never mind. I'm yeah, not going to go the, there. The hormones <laughs> just really take over. And, you know, they've got those little horns on their heads and they use them. They butt each other. They, you know. They, sure. they, they, the ram's horns. You the bet. ram's horns. You and bet. and unfortunately, those are fairly hard and, and a little bit pointy. So blood often follows the, you know, it's not quite like a couple of boy dogs sparring over a young lady. This is a fight often to the death. And, and it's just not, it's wasteful. It's obviously violent. And if a human tries to go in and break it up, the odds of getting injured are really, really high. Because both boys are going to be angry at you. It's like any other, you know, if you, if two people are having a fight, one of the, you know, and this is where kids get in trouble all the time. If mom and dad are fighting and you interrupt, you're going to get that anger, but it's going to come at you because you're interrupting the fight. The same thing happens with two rams fighting. If you try to, to, you know, you better be able to really grab both of them and pull them apart. It takes more than one person to break up a ram fight. And so it's not easy. It's not something that the average shepherd is going to do by themselves. This is practical. And so uh, you're, how many sheep do you really need to service 100 little girls? You don't need very many. You know, you're going to keep more than one because you can manage more than one. You can chain them down or whatever you have to do till the girls are done with their season and you figure out who's going to breed where. You're going to keep enough to keep your, your breeding program vibrant and to make sure that the few that you select are, in fact, fertile and, and good and all of that. But, you, you know, you've got 90 to 95 extra little boys running around. And so that's Chag HaPesach the festival of the culling of the rams, and they're all male, male yearlings, is to get rid of the, the guys, <laughs> the little boys, and uh, you know, you're not, not going to waste all that protein. So what are you going to do? You're going to have a festival, and people are going to eat, and they're going to break down into groups so that everybody has one. And, and if you haven't raised them, then you know, it's a market time. It's a clearly a market time. The other, so that's Chag HaPesach. So they turn into large festivals because there was no refrigeration. There's no there. refrigeration. There's not even cars to drive anywhere. So it's, it's all got to be come and grab and, and take what you can by hand, which you can put in a cart and maybe put on a donkey or something like that. It, it's, a whole different, it's a whole different way of living. Today, kids have no idea, and even the adults have no idea what life was like before refrigeration. Um, you know, you and I coming from Tucson, we know of the big ice houses that helped people keep things a little bit cold in Tucson. That was a major, major industry. The folks who ran the ice oh, houses oh, 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 were bet. wealthy because yep. that could allow you to keep food for two or three days instead of just overnight. Yeah, peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot, nine days old. Uh, that really was that really was a thing. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah. I get it. Ugh. And we in Colonial Williamsburg in the 1700s, dysentery was one of the major causes of death because people were eating spoiled food. 
very, very common and, and didn't have the medicinal way to, to treat it. And so dysentery was very often, and dehydration with the dysentery was a very common problem. So yeah, uh, we changed the world dramatically. So that's the Pesach part of, of Passover. There's actually two other names to the holiday. One is Chag Hamatzot, which is the, the unleavened bread, the flat bread. And today we sell it you know, square or round in boxes that can ship. The squares ship better. The rounds roll around and crumble, and you often get a box of crumbs if you order the round. And um, I don't personally think that it was as stiff or as cardboardy as it is now. I think it was much more like a tortilla because people, excuse me, would have taken it and mixed it and thrown it on the oven wall or in a pan in the oven and baked it very quickly. It's today, today's mechanization that allows the the cracker-like consistency yeah, to, yeah. to the matzah. And, and the palates have changed as well. Yeah. And habits. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the, and I think that the, the crispiness of it came because there was over, over the millennia a fear that the tortilla could still rise because it wasn't baked all the way solidly through. And so those who became more zealous about that baked it harder and harder and it became crisper and crisper that's interesting over okay time. Yeah, i never knew that okay yeah we we hear that for example uh sarah when she's when the visitors come and, and sit with abraham she runs and she makes flat bread because she doesn't have time to let the bread rise so you take flour and water you mix it up and you bake it and that's how flat breads are made the word pita means bread, so if you buy pita bread, you're buying bread bread. Pita is the Arabic and the Aramaic word for bread. Hebrew, it's lechem. But, uh, yeah. So Chag HaMatzot, why would you be eating the flat bread? Well, first of all, the only time that you don't use a flat bread in the temple is for the festival of Shavuot where it's a barley loaf and you allow it to rise. It's specified in, in Torah that that's a risen loaf. The rest of them are kind of the flatbreads and probably used because they don't have silverware, folks. Silverware had not yet been invented. And so you use the bread to Tear grab... off a piece and create yeah. it. And, and so, so you use yeah. it to not get your hands on your food. It makes a lot of sense that you're going to use that. And we see that in a lot of the cultures throughout the, the Near East and the Middle East that people use the, the bread to scoop up food. Oh, yeah. You look at India. And yeah. Yeah. A lot of places do that. So it's not surprising that that would have been done. Why do they need to do it? Because they have cleaned out all of the storage of the old wheat. And the, and the winter wheat harvest is coming in. So Passover, Pesach, is also Chag Hamatzot, the festival of bringing in the winter wheat. And why is it important to clean out the stores and, and all of that? That's in scriptures. It says, clean out everything that's old, get rid of it, bring in the new crop. I'm going to back into some of the, the plagues and stuff in Egypt here in a moment. We'll talk about that. But wheat that is stored in the ground and gets wet can develop, doesn't always, but it can develop a very, very toxic bacteria along the top crust of it. And we'll come back to that. Kind of mold, right? Yeah, kind of a moldy bacteria scuzz thing. And it, that's very, happens to be very toxic. And so the instruction is get all of that out, clean the larders, clean the, the storage bins, clean everything because the winter is the rainy season. And as we come to Passover, to Pesach, it is the end of the rainy season, which is part of why you can start to deal with the sheep because you're no longer having to shelter from rain because it's cold and it's miserable. And yes, it does snow in, in that part of the world some of the time, like it does in Tucson. It doesn't snow often, but it does snow. Some of the time, the further north you go, the more it snows. And so that the snow melt and the rain will all get into the storage 
So you want to clean all of that out, bring the, the new winter wheat that you've harvested, bring it in dry, and put it into clean clean storage area so that you can use it. But if you're going to have a festival meal to eat that lamb, you need bread, and so it's going to be unleavened bread. It's going to be a flat bread, and that's the matzah, the flat bread. That's the, that's the Hebrew word for flat bread is matzah. So, yeah not surprising and uh, so that's eaten for the seven slash eight days of passover seven days in israel eight uh, seven days for reformed jews in america and eight days for those who follow the tradition of the day of the diaspora the extra day because we're not in israel so if that's your tradition then you do eight days of passover and if israel is your tradition then you do seven days what is interesting you just lost me there so Jewish what, holidays pick an up an day? extra because there was a fear that you might not find out about the holiday in time. And so to make sure that you do a full celebration, they added an extra. It's called the Day of the Diaspora. So outside of Israel, it's traditional to have an extra day of celebration. And uh, mm. it, it's interesting. In Israel, they keep to the seven days, but they've added a second Seder which is common outside of Israel. And partially that's because you have one with this set of in-laws and then you have the other one with the other set of in-laws or you have one with your family and one with friends. Or It's just helpful to have more than one festival meal. It just is. And so, you know, at Congregation Eats Chaim, we are planning to have a first and second day of Passover. People can register. And you can do that online, or you can contact me or anybody else at the temple and make a reservation. We'll be doing it in the temple, and we'll also be doing it uh, virtually by Zoom and streaming. So you can join any of those ways. Are most of the people back, or are you still have a bunch uh, on, it's on virtual? It, most of them are still virtual. Really? Yeah. Still? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Most people are still virtual. I think that's just, uh, it's going to be a habit that people are going to have to break. And that's just going to take some time. A little more, con I, right now I think a lot of people are still afraid that maybe the numbers will start to come up again with spring break, with all of the movement, uh, even though many more people are vaccinated now. Uh, obviously we still have some breakthrough uh, infections with people who are vaccinated. Um, we're not quite we're not quite at the end of it but we're close i don't see the numbers coming up as they did a year ago or two years ago we're going into year three here um yeah it will be yeah 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 we've had two years of it and i and if you remember i said way back when that i expected this was going to last this was going to be a two-year event and i think we're going to see it it coming off all right so for example kaiser university has, has eliminated the mask in classes some students are still wearing it and they're welcome to i i no longer wear a mask in class i don't wear a mask at irsc anymore either some of the students still do and that's fine yeah, um but i think we're going to see things starting to come back to a more normal situation but let's get back to pay, to passover and pesach so we've got two of the things we've got the the lamb and we've got the the new wheat, the matzah. And the third name for Passover is Man Cherutenu, the time of our freedom, of our liberation. Because traditionally the coming out of Egypt was during the festival of Pesach that they had done the Seder uh, hurriedly in Egypt. And again, I can see a lot of sense in that because you're gonna wanna harvest the winter wheat you're going to want to cull the herd. You're going to do that Passover because if you do that, then what you're carrying out of Egypt is um, enough food, but a minimum of sheep, etc. To and and it's more manageable if you don't have all of the intact boys running around. So, yeah. So it makes a lot of sense for Passover to be part of the festival. A part of the the planning it's also the end of the rainy season so it's going to be a good time to travel lots of good reasons for it to be that time of year 
the cartage of, of lugging stuff and we know they came out with carts because it talks about it and I invite students to think about it right if you're going to be lugging stuff you're going to have big fat wheels just like your dirt bikes big fat wheels to go over sand and and the terrain cartage wheels whereas the Egyptians that'll follow will be coming in war chariots that are skinny and thin and do according to scripture get stuck in the sand especially the wet sand as they go to cross the where the waters have receded so yeah a lot of it makes complete sense if you really think about it scientifically it, it just makes a whole lot of sense so three reasons for the festival the lambing festival which was probably in existence for as long as there have been shepherds the winter wheat probably as long as people have harvested and cultivated wheat and, and you know not so much when you hunter gathered it but once you start cultivating and um, making farms then the winter wheat harvest becomes really important because as long as it's in the ground you're not going to leave and then realistically uh, hurricane season too now that comes into typhoons and hurricanes you bet all of those things um, although they are going to happen. Right? It's not the rainy season, but you will have that. And we've discussed it other times. I believe the parting of the sea probably was either an earthquake kind of tsunami event or a hurricane kind of event. Had, had to be one or the other so that the waters recede. We see that. We now have videos of the water receding and coming rushing back in when it finally decides oh, to come yeah. back in. Major tsunamis. I mean, it's yeah. quite obvious. The, oh, the description, the description of the tsunamis in Indonesia a few years back so mirrored the description of the crossing of the sea. And it was a reed sea, folks, not a red sea, a reed sea. Uh, somebody dropped an E on the type room floor when the Bibles were copied in English. And in Hebrew, Darn Germans. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, you know, probably the mistake wasn't made in German. It was probably made in English, but it's backed into the other versions. But it's not in, in, in if you really look at a. Okay, in Hebrew, Red Sea is Yamadom, the Red Sea. The Reed Sea is Yam Suf. Those are not close together. You're not going to make a mistake between those two names. Nowhere close. Nowhere close. But you can see where somebody could make a mistake between reed and red. Because Suf is a reed. And, and here in Florida, we understand what a reed sea is. We've got them all over the place here. Try the Everglades. Yeah, try crossing that with with carts full of goods. Or the savannas. Yeah, <laughs> close you're, by. you're, yeah. you're not going to get through. Yeah, or any of the, the reed areas along the intercoastal or anywhere along there, you're just not going to get through the reeds. That's the problem they faced. So in order to go through on dry land, the water has to recede, and that's caused by a number of reasons. Yeah. And if you read Scripture carefully, it's not that Moses puts his, you know, I love Cecil B. DeMille, and it's wonderful, and it's great, it's great art and, and all of that. But if you read the text... It's the east wind that blows that parts the sea. People don't pay attention to that. It's the east wind. Moses is simply pointing and saying, look this way, because everybody's staring at the Egyptians. They're screaming, they're whooping, they're yelling, and where are we going to turn? You know, when we started looking at the Egyptians, there was only water behind. And the wind is blown all night, and nobody's going to look back at the water because it's there. You're going to stare at the Egyptians because they're noisy and they're loud. And so Moses says, you know, look here, look here, look, 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 quickly, look. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And obviously, I don't think it was two million people, the number in Scripture. I think that's because we don't understand the word Elif. It's usually translated as thousands. I think it meant clans or groups, a lot smaller than a thousand. Reason I say that, I can't see two million people doing anything quickly. I mean... We can't evacuate Port St. Lucie, which is a half a million people, <laughs> overnight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. She instantly clogs on 95, and nobody goes anywhere. And, you know, they didn't have, they're going to cross through a tiny little piece of, of cleared sea? I don't think so. 
So the Egyptian turnpike wasn't... Uh, yeah, the Egyptian turnpike was not very big. It was more like the old West Virginia one. <laughs> West Having Virginia. been on the West Virginia turnpike when it was Tulane. There was a time when the Pennsylvania turnpike was Tulane. Way back No then. way. Really? Yeah, and they're still... Well, they still have parts that close in the winter because of snow and things like that in the mountains. Yeah, we we take our transportation for granted, and every winter up north, they they discover it's not quite so impervious to weather. Yeah, there are times they close the lemon. Yeah, you know, did you see that pop up snowstorm? Yeah, I am. I've never seen anything like that. That was bizarre. Yeah. Well. Things are interesting. Weather is weather is getting much more volatile, and uh, I think that's just a part of of everything that's going on. We're not we're not leaving a gentle footprint on the earth right now. We need to, but we're not. So those are some of the different things of Pesach. So let's go back, and now let's look at the plagues that are associated with it, and. I think that there is a reasonable scientific explanation for them. I think that the the red that starts, the first one is blood, right? The, it doesn't say that the water is blood, but it's the color of blood. And the there's two things to deal with here. One, pigments are not yet where we have them today, right? Today we would talk, your, your shirt's a brick red and... and um, you know, the, the mic is pink. Pink's an advanced color description. And so what they mean is it's dark and, and ugly. And it could be an algae bloom. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Sure. Right, because the, there's an interesting set of research that's been done on societies and colors. So you don't hear a lot about uh, blues early in early cultures. And some languages still don't have blues. But they'll have a dark reddish color, they'll have a, a light white-ish color, and they'll have a black color. That's, w that's where cultures seem to start, red, black, and white. And we see a lot of red, black, and white rituals, right? So, you know, red we already know has many different, it's the clay, which I would call orange or terracotta. That's called red. And red hair is not red, it's orange, right, gingy, ginger color. Um, and blood is red. The red cow is also an orange kind of color, the red, the red heifer. And the red, the hyssop and, and the red um, plants that go in are not bright red. They're, they're different shades of red depending on what it is. Some are bright, like a poppy is bright, but other reds are not as bright. And they just don't make quite the distinction. They don't have carmine, and they don't have brick, and they don't have all these other colors that we talk about today. Our color palette is huge, and thank you, Crayola, for making you know, five million names for colors. But we've done that, and the jewelry industry actually tags it similarly to the way that computer folks do with so much green so much blue so much this so much that with with a kind of a tint scale to it but i have at home for coloring jewelry a great big wheel of colors and you kind of hold the gemstone up close to it and then you use the number for that color right because colors have become much more important but they weren't back then so the the bloodish and i'm going to say bloodish water is probably an algae bloom and you can't drink that water it's yucky right and the well, bloom it'll kill you too yeah depending on what algae yeah, yeah right it can and so it's going to infect the whole water table it's going to affect the wells because that's the same water basin and if it's blooming in the nile it's blooming everywhere and it's only if you're away from that that you can find clean water you might be able to find a spring that doesn't come from the Nile where the algae bloom is. And if you've got an algae bloom, guess what? You get frogs. And you get dead fish. And you get all kinds of things that happen. 
and then you get flies and the flies land on the cows and on the people and cause boils and if we really do have a hurricane kind of a season or an earthquake kind of thing you might have hail and tornadoes and the hail is going to damage the winter wheat crop in Egypt. It doesn't take out Goshen, where the Israelites are living. That's important. So the Egyptians lose their winter wheat. And then come the locusts because there's not enough food. And grasshoppers become locusts when there's a famine. Of course, you know, when else? It's when you really need them to become locusts. But, but they do. And the word in scripture is what the hail hadn't damaged, the locusts ate. So they have an entire crop failure. We've seen that in parts of Africa and in the, in the East. We see crop failures. We've seen it in Russia. We've seen it in China. We've seen crop failures. It's, it's not new. Now we can airdrop food to people. We still don't do a good job of that, folks. But in those days, it would have caused, it would have caused them, here's the piece, to use their old wheat that may have had that bacteria or mold that I talked about before. Now, why would that take out the firstborn? Uh, that's a subtle thing, and you have to understand the culture. In those days, in that part of the world, the firstborn gets a double cut off the top, which means if there's a toxin on the top layer of the wheat and the firstborn gets the double cut off the top, they get a double dose of the poison. They're toast. They're toast. And that's and that that double that firstborn double portion goes through humans and through animals. Firstborns were considered very important because it determined whether or not a person could have children or an animal could have children. We didn't have it was, C sections were not successful back then. They might have saved the kid, but they're not going to save the mother. And so the opener of the womb, if you will, the firstborn, is very important because it, it determines who among the population can have children and who can't, who's going to die because they can't give birth. So, yeah, that's why the firstborn is so honored. And in Judaism, the firstborn becomes dedicated to God. That's why we have what's called Pidyon Ben, the redemption of the firstborn. Instead of giving the child to the priests for God uh, to be raised in the temple or in whatever holy sites are, are around, then uh, you redeem him. You buy him back. It's a symbolic thing now, but much more significant back then. They, they really looked at firstborn as being an indicator of the fertility of the mother with good reason, because it was without medical interventions, without the ability to, you know, uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for medical science. The doctor knew the umbilical cord was wrapped twice around my neck. Most babies born like that strangle in birth because the cord's not big enough to, you know, tightens as the baby's born. Does the scripture show how large families were back then? Not entirely. I mean, we you know we see that that Isaac has just um, Ishmael and Jacob, and then Jacob goes and has twelve twelve sons and at least one daughter. Some traditionalists say that oh he had twelve and twelve. There's no evidence in in scripture about that. That's that's people wanting there to be females for the males um, but we know that there's a, a daughter Dina and we don't know if there's other children that either didn't make it to adulthood and would have just gone by the wayside and we really don't know how many other women or girls were, were born in the family and they're not always mentioned if they're not part of the story they don't get mentioned if they're not if they're part of the story but they're not a significant player in most cases they don't get named like Noah's wife is never named. She's semi-significant, but she's the one who, she's never named. She's just called the wife, Lot's wife. She doesn't have her own individual role. It's, it's kind of interesting. 
Rather sexist. I think that there were also men who, well, um, Abraham's servant who gets sent to find a wife for Isaac isn't named. Tradition names him, but he's not typically named. There's lots of characters in scriptures who don't have a name. And usually legends and, and tradition will assign a name, but it's not always in scripture. And the word Adam, we use Adam as if it's a name, but it simply means human. The name Adam. The name Adam means human. Really? Right. So huh. you would say that I am B'nai Adam. I am a child of Adam. I am, I am a human. I'm a member of the human species. Okay. That's interesting. And Adam's wife, Eve, Chava, means life. The life giver. She's the one who gives birth. Wow. Yeah. Names are really kind of interesting. Even David, the name David means beloved. He was a beloved king. Saul, Shaul, the requested one, the king who was requested. His name might have been, you know, Peter. I don't know. Whatever. But those are probably titles. Right? The king, the requested one, was Saul. Shaul, the one that they, the people asked for so he could lead the armies. And the David's the beloved, the popular king who comes up. His son Solomon, Shlomo, is the peacemaker. Now he makes peace in a really um, wicked kind of way because he does it by killing everybody who doesn't agree with him, uh, which was a common way for kings to make peace in those days. But it is a time of peace for the people who survive, <laughs> for the people who agree with him. And Stuart was talking about democracy and being a peaceful transition of power. It wasn't in those days. Well, you know, semi-peaceful because dad died. Uh, but there's, there's clearly a war that goes on between the sons of David as to which one of them is going to inherit the throne. And Solomon is Bathsheba's second-born son, the one born in wedlock, not the one who dies is the one, the love child from before. But again, you have to read scripture a little bit carefully to pick that up. It's a, it, the, the stories are much more interesting and detailed than most people realize, and they probably were much like theater in the early days when people didn't do as much reading, although clearly people did some, some reading and writing because in scripture it says, write these words on the doorposts of your house, and you don't give that instruction to people who can't read and write. It doesn't make sense, right? If I told you, you know, to calculate something and you weren't good with numbers, it wouldn't have any value to you. Same thing. Yeah. So clearly, there's at least some literacy going on. If the instruction is to write it. Now that's really interesting. Where did the written word start? <laughs> well, we credit the Phoenicians for the alphabet that we use. Okay. Right. And that makes sense because they were part of the trade network. And people who do trade need to keep books. You need to balance and figure out who does what, when, where. And so alphabet becomes important. You need to know how many widgets and wadgets and goats and rams and sheep and whatever it is that you're trading, you're trading. Silk bolts of cloth or whatever. Wheat, cotton, we can keep going. All the things that they would have, uh, myrrh, frankincense, those things have been traded for a long time. Frankincense and myrrh grow in and around Yemen. That's where they're indigenous. And if they're used in the temple ritual, hello, they get there by trade. They get there by trade. So trade is very, very old. As long as there's been people and people have been migrating, there's been trade. You know, I like to tell my students, if we lived in Florida and we didn't have trade, how many things can you make out of an orange? Can you make a dress out of an orange? It'd be a little hard. We'd probably figure out a way, but it's much easier to take this bag of oranges and say, hey, I'll give you these delicious Florida oranges if you give me a bolt of cotton. It just makes sense. So trade happens almost immediately. And we see that, archaeologists see that. They see coins and, and pottery coming out of China 
China is recognized as being the developers of porcelain, which makes sense because they have tea and they're gonna they're gonna heat the tea and cook it and seep it and pour it into something. So teapots and, and teacups come out of China. When they get to Europe, people want a handle to hold it. They don't want to just hold the cup. So they start attaching cups to it. And didn't we always call it fine China? Right, the porcelain oh, sure. that comes out of China is called China. Yeah. Surprise, it's because it came from China. They had China had a lot of technology and had phenomenal influences up and down the king the the silk road rather and the silk road goes down through israel and goes into africa through egypt and in that area so you know stuff m is moving and we see that because we see goods and we see coins from different realms all over and um, it's going to continue for millennia not surprising the the, the etrog the citrus that's used for the festival of Sukkot in fall is a Chinese ornamental citrus. It's not indigenous to Israel. It's indigenous to China, and yet it is the fruit that's preferred. Scripture doesn't say that that fruit. It just says a beautiful fruit. Use a beautiful fruit. So, but it has traditionally become the etrog. And interestingly, the quote-unquote best pedigrees of trees is in Italy right now. Thank you, Marco Polo, possibly. I don't know. I don't know when those trees, those orchards in Italy would have gotten started. But it's an ornamental. Most people aren't going to eat the fruit of an etrog. It's, it's extremely, extremely sour. It's like a lemon on steroids. And then I would love it. You probably would. Some, you know, there's always a battle I'm among really the, into there's that. a battle among the kids to want to eat it. But if the fruit is, let's say, four or five inches in diameter, about that big, for those who want to see it, then the rind is going to be two thirds of that. It's very, very thick rind, and just a little bit of fruit flesh on the inside, and very big seeds. And I have some baby etrog trees in, in my garden right now that will be. Those are for sale for anyone who wants it, one of the plant sales. So more on the plant sales we get later into April. So are they growing, the they are, plant sales? They're the yes and no. I mean, you know, we've had a couple of COVID scares over the months Yeah, yeah. that have interfered. But we do have a steady, we have a group that comes every month to see what we have new. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, to me, a lot of fun. Well, gardening and my goodness, yeah. the, your yard, <laughs> your patio. You like the flowers? I love flowers. Oh, I love. I love the. I, I'm love the I'm picture. cultivating some of those things, and and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll have some babies to to pass on in the coming months. Well, you've got some amazing pictures. Well, I love to take pictures, and I think that shows too. Uh, maybe I'll bring some of my photography out and offer people that they can buy prints. Of this and that as well. You should. You yeah. should because, you know, some of those are dramatic. I was starting to sell some of my photography actually the three months before COVID. I just had just started to bring it out. And I've, in fact, I've got to finish matting some of it. It's, it. It got stopped because of COVID. And everywhere that I was going to be selling it wasn't there because of COVID. So. Sure. Hopefully, maybe I'll bring some of them out at some of the plant sales. I'm giving some serious thought to shifting the location to a more outdoor. The, obviously, the downside of that is if it rains, we're going to have to do what the what the fest is doing, which is right. postponed to a rain date. More on that as we get further into this month. I've got a board meeting this Sunday. We'll see where that goes, have that discussion. So lots of different things were coming up on Passover, and Passover is celebrated on the 15th, the eve of the 15th <laughs> of uh, Nisan, which happens to be April, the evening of April 15th, not the eve to, but the eve of uh, April 15th, that Friday. So there won't be a regular Friday night service that night. It'll be the Seder. Dinner starts, not sa dinner, Seder starts at six and the dinner will be served around seven. And it's gonna be chicken, brisket, salmon, 
with all of the trimmings and no yeast. Not hard to make. And uh, some matzo ball soup, some gefilte fish, all those exciting things. Some horseradish. Yeah. And if we look at the Seder plate, so again, the way that the Seder is practiced now is not the way that Passover meal would have been celebrated even in the days of Jesus. It's going to end around 67 to 70 when the temple is destroyed by the Romans. You can no longer do the Pesach, the, the lambing festival. So it's going to dramatically change the way the meal is done. And the rabbis at that time looked around and they combined a Roman symposium with the the Zoroastrian or Persian festival of spring Naruz and they bring in the Haftzin plate they don't call it that the Seder plate has spring vegetables and things like that to show you that it's spring that's a spring festival so that gets overlaid over the other parts of Pesach Passover and the Seder as it's practiced today is that blending of traditions with the Jewish peace remembering the older holidays. The society is slowly becoming more, uh, more urban and less rural. And so there's fewer farmers, more city dwellers, more city crafting. And so the celebration changes just as any of the holidays. Look at how Halloween has changed over the last 40 or 50 years. We have almost no kids who really do the, the trick-or-treating the way it was done uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Now we have trunk-or-treats. We didn't have that 100 years ago. Sure, sure. Because right? there weren't yeah. trunks to do a trunk-or-treat. And Halloween has become the second biggest decorating holiday of the year. Thank you, Hallmark and American Greetings. Yep. And other folks who make decorations. Yeah. Party City. Here yep. we come. Absolutely. So, you know, holidays do change and they do morph and that's natural and normal and indeed healthy. Religion and practices of holidays and rituals is not intended to be stagnant. It's not intended to be isolated and, and separated from the people for whom it's there. Forgive me, I'm having an itchy nose today. And... um so this is as good a segue as any. We're coming up on the last five or six minutes of the show. And I'm going to do this request, folks. If you'd like what you hear, if this is worth listening to, then please consider sponsoring one or more episode of Ask a Rabbi. We are looking for sponsors. And it's important to keep keep this going if you like it. And you can contact uh, Gregor Carroll at the radio station 772-340-1590. After the show, and they'll be glad to work with you to help develop a sponsorship. It also gets you some advertising, of advertising other times, along with in the show. And I clearly will mention anybody who sponsors a uh, an episode or more. So that's one thing. The Seder is April fifteenth. You need to register for that. You can contact me or register online, or uh, I'm putting up an event later today up on Facebook. You can also contact us through that. So yeah. different ways. Is Two J's preparing the food? Not or this. Or not this year. Not no. this year. Not this year. Okay. But it'll be a full ritual meal, and hopefully it'll be tasty. Cool. People have been enjoying the meal, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. So, any questions, anybody? You're welcome to call in in the last couple of minutes. Uh, we talked about Passover today. We talked a little bit about the different roots of the festival. We talked about some of the different um, the plagues and, and how they could have had a very natural kind of a background. Let's talk just a couple of minutes here about the Seder plate. The Seder plate is also evolving. Uh, when I was a child, there were five things on the Seder plate. Now there's six. And on the Seder plate that we use in the temple, there's probably about 10 or 12 different things. And in fact, this year we're going to put a, a, a sunflower out for what's going on in Ukraine because we need to come to a world where we don't do that kind of stuff, period. We just, we need to find better solutions to whatever challenges, uh, threats, resources, etc. the world needs. Just hard to imagine. 
the whole uh, thing just, is so uh, absurd. I just, you know. It's I, sickening. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it really it, is. You know, it's funny because when you're as old as I am, um, of course, I was born. Yeah, the dinosaurs right were in your backyard. Yeah, they, we they were. Yeah, right at the end of World War II. So, I mean, I only had the old newsreels to see. We're yeah. watching this in real yeah. time. Yeah. Now we're getting videos of the scene, and it's oh. it's a different, it's a oh. different experience. And the poor people, I, it's like, oh my god. Yeah. 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 And it's the refugees. And the oh, thing. It's, it's it's mind boggling. And it's going to be interesting to see how that works out in the next coming years. Who's going to take in the refugees? Who's going to help them? Uh, and God willing, Ukraine will survive and be strong. After, but it's going to be very hard after this. They had a story on NBC Nightly News where this Ukrainian family was reunited because they came to the United States and ICE arrested them. Yeah. And, of course, threw them in different holding areas, they call them, I guess. And it's like somehow, some way, an attorney got involved and, you know, and they reunited yesterday. And it, you just think, this is amazing. So the reporter mm. asked the question, so what are your impressions of the United States? And they just kind of rolled their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. With what? You throw me in jail. Yeah. Yeah. Here I am just trying to survive and and you arrest me for it. Yeah, it, it's it's like with all things, it's going to take a while for things to sort out, and unfortunately, people will be hurt and harmed along the way. And uh, I'm not making light of that in any stretch of the imagination. That it's a horrible thing, and uh, yeah, how much of the world will just sit and watch it? I don't know. God willing, Passover will be a time of freedom for all peoples this year. Boy, that. <laughs> Yeah, Wouldn't that be here. wonderful? Yep. Please, God. I'll have I. This has been Rabbi Shafir Loeb, and this has been Ask a Rabbi. And thank you for listening, whether you've been listening on Facebook or you've been listening on YouTube or...